Hi all, thank you for coming, my mother Patty, to the seminars. Uh, well, I have to just uh, remind two things. One is that it's one week uh, left only to vote for changing the hours to the of the seminars. If you want to change, maybe on Fridays at twelve or maintain this hour. So please, if you uh, haven't done yet, please vote. The second thing is that uh, on Tuesday uh, of the um, next week there is a seminar from the from people from the MBL. EMBL, so if you want to open the at 10, okay, so just for your information. And now, today, on Women's International Day, we are very happy and very grateful that we have Fiona Thomas to present. So as all you know, uh, she's a PI of the Institute that uh, she has been working here during a long of years. And well, thank you very much, Fiona, for collaborating and go ahead with the talk. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Am I doing this wrong? Okay. So, uh, in case there were people didn't want to come on a Friday afternoon, I put the word sex. <laughs> in the title, so uh, it also always uh, makes things more attractive. But I'm uh, gonna talk to you about um, some really uh, fascinating uh, phenomenon that we've observed from like a naturalistic point of view, and that uh, we've been studying since we observed it. And it's basically regarding reproductive strategies of the seagrass Posidonia theanica under stress. Um, this has been a huge group effort. Uh, there's a lot of people involved from my lab, uh, other people from other parts of Mediterranean Sea, the group of Gabriele Procaccini, who's the expert in serious genetics. And it's an ongoing project. Obviously, I don't think I need to make a lot of effort for this crowd to convince you that you probably do. If you don't care about seagrasses, you should. Not only are they fascinating uh, plants, but they provide many ecosystem services. Uh, they both for climate change. Julia Castro did a talk a few weeks ago about the role as nursery habitats for fish. They uh, provide us clean waters. They are a main uh, symbol of clear waters in the Balearic Islands. So, I'm, you know, it's a short seminar. So, I think if you are not convinced, then we can talk later. And unfortunately, uh, seagrasses are declining worldwide. They are in coastal shallow areas, so they are subject to many uh, human stressors, habitat destruction, nutrient pollution, etc. And so they're declining. This map on the left is a review from a, a while ago, 2009, where basically where there was work uh, that had looked at uh, seagrass um, trends. From in most places, you see that the dominant is the red, which is a decrease. This is a more recent paper from Europe from 2019. Again, um, most of, a lot of this is the purple, which is declining. So there's a worldwide phenomenon, although in areas where there's been management and conservation efforts, there is evidence of recovery. And actually this paper also showed this. And I think Nuria was involved in this paper. Uh, but one problem that's harder to manage is climate change, right? And warming is especially um, concerning. And one uh, uh, or, um, expression of warming is this uh, marine heat wave, right? These events that are uh, intense and that uh, organisms are not adapted to, and they're not like a mean, slowly mean increase in temperature, but uh, something that is more abrupt and intense. There's been this is a, a map showing recent marine heat waves, and you can see there have been many uh, around the world, uh, in the North Pacific, in, in Australia, and probably you may or somewhere of you may, you may not, because you're a younger crowd, <coughs> be familiar with uh, the marine heat wave that occurred in the Mediterranean Sea in 2003, which was at that time the strongest marine heat wave for which there was data. So the strongest marine heat wave recorded then, you know? And what happens? Well, we've seen that indeed warming and marine heat waves have negative effects on seagrasses. 
this work done again by Nuria, oops, by Nuria and colleagues that shows that, you know, warming triggers cigarette decline in Pacifica Oceanica, but this is also being observed with eelgrass in the Pacific Northwest, in many areas of Australia, et cetera. So it's a worldwide concerning phenomenon because when we lose these species, we lose the ecosystems and so the ecosystem services associated with it, et cetera. So how do these plants recover? What are the mechanisms of resilience? So understanding how these plants recover is important for their management, potential restoration uses, et cetera. So, Seagrasses are, are plants, are actual um, plants, not algae. So they have an origin in the terrestrial world and then some um, came back to the sea. And so they have some traits that are, are quite unique. And for the, those of you who maybe have never paid much attention to a seagrass, basically they are clonal plants. So these are all individuals of the same clone which uh, grows uh, vegetatively through this rhizome. So the below ground stem basically grows and it keeps creating new plants. And this is the main dominant way that seagrasses grow and expand and therefore recover usually when there's a, a loss, right? To anchoring, heat wave, uh, death, et cetera. And the way the, the some species there's very different types of seagrasses and some species can grow much faster than others, but this is usually the main mechanism. But seagrasses are angiosperms, which are flowering plants. So they produce, reproduce sexually, so they make flowers, fruits. And so this sexual reproduction is very important because they have this clonal growth, but the sexual reproduction is very important in terms of, for example, it provides new genetic variation, right? And that's key for adaptation, for evolution, et cetera. For many of the species, these um, life stages that are associated with sexual reproduction, either the flowers themselves, sometimes the fruits or the seeds, many times are mechanisms of dispersal to other areas, which enhances connectivity, enhances uh, you know, colonization of new areas. And so if we're thinking of a stress, Having genetic variation is good because then you are having a, a higher potential to adapt to the stressor and it also allows you to potentially escape, right? For some species, these, uh, these plants, the seeds that they produce remain in the, in the sediments where they are produced. And so they, they are what we call seed banks, which also can be important if the Above ground plants are dead, but there's a seed bank it can recover. And also there's increasing interest in using these, these uh, sexual reproduction life stages for restoration. So considering repro sexual reproduction is important. And there's these, the seagrasses are very different because they come from actually different lineages of evolution back to the sea. So there are many different types of reflective ways. I'm just gonna mention a couple, and then we're gonna talk about Poseidon. But this is just an example for eelgrass, Zospera marina, which is the most widespread uh, species in the world. It's in the, basically all the northern hemisphere. So here, what you see are inflorescence. So these plants have both male and female flowers, and then the female flowers get fertilized, and these little bumps are the seeds developing. And so these shoots, these leaves that have these flowers can detach and float. The seeds can also detach and float and they can also settle in, in the sediment and create seed bags. So this is one example. Another example, which is closer to home is Thymodothea nodosa, which doesn't have a female and, and male flowers in the same individual, is a monoisha species, sorry, the oyster species. So it has male and female individuals. And in this case, the, the, you probably can't see, but this is a, a, the male flower sticking out. These are really small flowers, hard to see. The, the seeds, the fruits and the seeds actually remain attached below ground to the sediment. So these ones don't float. Uh, uh, they don't disperse completely. You know? And so this is, most of the seagrasses do some kind of combination of this. But then there's vivipary. Vivipary is what we are. Animal, we mammals are viviparous, right? So this, um, 
these uh, plants are detaching their their juvenile in the uh, in the stage of an egg. We don't do that, right? We give birth to an individual that has developed. So vivipari is as discussed in this in this plant is instead of the seed detaching the seed starts developing attached to the plant, right? And then when it's developed, it detaches and floats. Most vivipar is, vivipar is very scare, uh, scarce in the terrestrial realm. We have, what, 300,000 plants of, of terrestrial plants. Only about 50 do this, mainly mangroves, and about six species of seagrasses. And then some terrestrial plants, I think, like some cacti and stuff. But it's a very uncommon phenomenon in the plant realm. It's very common in the animal, right? So this is what we know so far. Posidonia is our species of interest here. Obviously, we all care about it. It provides many ecosystem services. So I'm not really going to say more about it. I'm sure you've all seen it in the water. and. <laughs> Uh, it's suffering from marine heat waves. So again, this is just uh, showing data from the Mediterranean, which is a hot spot for warming and marine heat waves. This is just a paper showing the number of heat wave, marine heat waves that have occurred in the past 30 years. And you see the red numbers are more than 100 heat waves. Yeah, those are 90 to 100. So basically, there have been many marine heat waves. Heat waves are increasing the Mediterranean Sea. It's not a you know, it's not an anecdotal problem. And this is, again, data from Nuria that shows that mortality of seagrass, of Procidonia, sorry, increases with this um, annual uh, temperature, sea surface temperature. So warming uh, causes mortality of Procidonia. So marine heat waves are a problem. And so how is Procidonia going to recover from this marine heat waves? Thinking about sexual reproduction, measure sexual reproduction is something that some of us are interested in studying. You know? And so, as I said before, seagrasses mainly uh, grow clonally, you know, this vegetative growth. And, and potidon is like a sequoia. It's a really, really slow growing species. It grows about one to six centimeters horizontally a year. So you can imagine that if you have just even an anchor you know, cleaning a little piece or having a mass mortality from something, natural recovery is going to be hard and slow. So what happens with sexual reproduction? So um, as I said, well, I didn't say that actually, uh, Posidon is also monocious like the Zospera marina. So it has male, female and male plants. So it has an inflorescence which contains a few flowers and these um, and so, and the flowers are male and female. So, and then, uh, so this you can see the, the pollen and the eggs starting to develop. And so, basically, it only flowers once a year, which is in the fall, you know, in September, October, November, which is the spring in Australia, anyway, because the, all the other Posidonias are there. And when, uh, after flowering, uh, the fruits take about six months to mature. And once they mature, they, they actually detach of the plant and they float. So they go up to the surface and they start floating. These are pictures from the, in the, on the sea on the surface. And many of them arrive, arrive to, to the beaches where they basically die, right? Because they get burned out and they die, which are a good source for collecting fruits, though, for experiments, for restoration. So um, those that those seeds that are open and actually come down into the, you know, are open and fall into the sea where they uh, actually recruit, um, they start germinating. Um, and, but there's very, very low uh, seedling recruitment success. So there's high mortality of these. So the sexual investment really, um, is a lot of effort that doesn't seem to compensate mortality rates. At this, point. this is just you know, how uh, through time the seed, the fruit, the seed, and how it goes through time. And so, what do we know from this flowering? You no, know, so uh, earlier on, um, it was you know usually 
not very common, very infrequent, unpredictable. And this is just an example from Italy from 90s. It is a 90s. You know, they've um, monitored two sites and, you know, one year there was high flowering, the rest there was. Um, there's been notion that um, plant age affects flowering, nutrient availability affects flowering, but what we're seeing more and more now is that temperature may be involved. So this is uh, in 2003, there was this marine heat wave I mentioned earlier, and there was the first uh, extensive mass flowering of, of Posidonia theanica, at least to the Western Mediterranean ever observed. And again, Nuria's group, they did a, a cool analysis looking at temporal patterns of flowering through time across the Mediterranean Sea. And they clearly saw that the warm years, uh, there was a much higher uh, frequency of flowering, meaning many more meadows flowered. And within those meadows, there were many more flowers. So indeed, there is this flowering of Posidonia Africanica that seems to be associated with warming. And it has been interpreted probably as a stress response, right? Because this warming creates mortality. So these plants are creating this, are investing in this sexual reproduction that they often do not in response to, you know, improving potential adaptation, dispersion, et cetera. And so in 2022, there was one of those marine heat waves that you saw in the map. I see not because that was until 2021. There was another marine heat wave, which has also been the strongest since the last four years. And associated with this warming event, we have seen, and uh, by we is a super large we of like, I think there's 90 people involved. Uh, and this is a, a word that's been uh, prepared by Patrika Struck. Um, basically, in the Western Mediterranean, these, so the cause represent in a semi-quantitative uh, way the, the intensity of flowering. So dark colors, reddish, or high flowering. So basically, you can see that in the Western Mediterranean, associated with this marine heat wave, there was a very, very extensive flowering again. So this also, you know, again, we see that there's this extreme warming triggers mass flowering in Posidon Atlantica. So it was not a one time event. No, this is you know, stronger and stronger data that are uh, supporting this. And so these are just some pictures of you know, what the flowers and the mass flowering look like in some areas. And so this is what we found in the Balearic Islands. But one day, in addition to this, uh, as you may know, we are part of a citizen science project, which is called Observadores de Mar, where we have a project on seagrass reproduction and people who, to bring photos of what they see. And I got this image, which was something, this was in January, which was something I had never seen before which uh, got me super excited because I thought it was something that had been described once. And so I called this person who, so this is the Jonathan Delgado, the, the seagrass watcher who uploaded a picture. And I called Enrique Ballesteros, who is a scientist in Blanes, in the Jessica Blanes, who's an expert marine ecologist and was also an expert botanist and who described for the first time pseudo vivipari, which is not even vivipari and is not normal reproduction in a marine plant, which was Procedonia canica. So I call him, I sent him this picture and I said, could this be pseudo vivipari? And he said, yes, it could be because, and you'll see in a, in a, in a moment, the pictures that he, when he described it first, it didn't look like that. And this is because this is the early development of this. So what is pseudo vivipari? So pseudovivipary is like the exception of the exception. Again, only very few plants in the world uh, have this, about 50. They're usually in very extreme environments like Arctic, Alpine, desert, where the conditions are extreme. And it's basically asexual, so non-sexual reproduction. So the plants 
when they start developing the reproductive tissue, so the flowers, instead of actually developing all of it and doing their reproduction, they actually shift and produce a clone of the mother, right? So, so you, you have, I mean, in, it's not the same as clonal growth, right? It's not the vegetative thing that, there's the production of this flowering tissue and then it changes. And which, if it's already energetically costly to do a flowering, imagine the mechanisms that are going on behind it. No? So, and it's called pseudo vivipary because it's asexual, pseudo, and vivipary because, like what we saw with vivipary, this new little clone is attached to the mother, right? So that's why it's vivipary because it's still close to it. And so basically, when uh, this, so as I said, this was before this description that Enrique Ballesteros did in 2005, which I will explain in a minute, this had only been seen in terrestrial plants. And so when he first observed this in Posidonia Pianica, which uh, is this, one of these pictures, for example, because you can see the adult, this is the pedicle where the flower would be, but here instead of having a flower, you have a baby, a baby plant. So he observed it in Formentera, that year that there was that mass flowering event after that mass at Marie Heathrow, right? And then this has only been, and so he described it there. Then a few years later, uh, Australian researchers found it in Posidonia Australis, so another Posidonia, in Shark Bay, which is near close to the distribution edge of the species, also after Marine Heathrow. And so, um, and in the, uh, for the first work for Posidonia, it was more for like botanical evidence, but not genetic. And they actually uh, confirmed it genetically. So they did the genetics and confirmed that the little baby was a clone of the mother. No? So all of a sudden, we see this, like, okay, what's going on? And we start looking to see if this is just a one thing even like in Formentera, like Kike found, or if this is happening more extensively, if it's true, if it's really vivipary, like can we demonstrate it with genetics? And if this is vivipary, what's happening? Because nobody has ever been able, like done any naturalistic study of what the plants are doing, et cetera. So we went ahead and tried to do this. So we first, um, Basically, the, the genetics, well, we didn't do the genetics, but I'm saying, uh, showing you this first. So when at two of the sites where we found it, so it was not only at one site, uh, we collected uh, different, like 20 pairs or, of the adults and their babies. And, you know, we did that, well, the Gabrielle and his team with the geneticists. So I can't really say much about genetics, it's not my thing, but basically, all the plantlets were indeed clones. So we, it, this is the first genetic evidence of pseudoviviparin in Posteria Fianica, and the second evidence of pseudoviviparin in a marine plant. No? So that's already pretty cool. And so then we went and did the sampling. So initially, the, in the year 2003, pseudoviviparin was observed in this site here in Menorca. And so we sampled either through um, transects or just snorkeling for pets and rafts and across the Balearic Islands. And so we found that basically, so all the triangles that are dark gray is present. So basically all but three or four don't have cerebrary. And in the pie charts, that's where we actually need quantification and the cerebrary is in green. And uh, then you have fruits, those so the ones that have fruits are yellow. Uh, the ones that were degraded, were in pink because we sampled this in, in March, April, May, which is already late in the season because the flowering takes place in October. And, uh, and we found that, you know, in 86% of these sites, there was a delivery. So this is evidence that it's a no, not one site thing that it was described for uh, Posidonia Fianica and the first time or for Posidonia Fianica. This is an extended behavior through uh, a large scale. And also interestingly, some sites had plantlets, sorry, had plants that in the inflorescence had both the clove and the fruit, which is also pretty cool. 
So again, this is the first large scale evidence of pseudovipary ever reported in a marine plant. So, you know, I think this is pretty good. <laughs> And so we're like, okay, so this is happening. Let's try to study it. So it won, and basically a lot of work has been done in this site, where, is, where most territory takes place. So we've um, had permanent plots where we've been tagging the plants and monitoring their development, et cetera. So, oh my God, it's already 4.30, okay. So now I'm going to get the results really fast. So basically take home messages. Um, these are the platelets through time. There's different colors that present how many individuals there are, right? And so basically already in May, uh, you know, there are individuals that have five, uh, five, four, three, two, or one divisions. And, and these are the permanent plots. So in, in this decrease in, in numbers is because uh, a lot of these uh, plantlets are detaching from the adult. Um, so, you know, there's a deep, you know, most, most plantlets have one, two, five individuals, and these plantlets don't change in size. So the ones that were five is probably, well, the ones that were five, I'm not sure yet, but the ones that are two or three are probably because the two or three flowers within the inflorescence became two or three plantlets rather than the plantlet dividing. Um, and they detach. And so how do they look like? Basically, so this is the leaf length of these plantlets by age through time in May, June, July. So they grow. And the number of leaves in them decreases. And this is the total leaf area, which is the important thing. So the, the, the obviously the ones that are, are five or more have like leaf areas that are you know, the ones have 30 and the others have 150 centimeters square. Why is this important? Because seedlings, which are the result of sexual reproduction, in May are starting, the seeds are starting to germinate. So these guys are already orders of magnitude bigger uh, when the other ones aren't even born, right? So in terms of the, the successful survivalship recruitment of this plant, this is critical. Um, yes, so this is number. And, and also what happens to, to not be only the program, but the roots. The roots are critical for rooting and, and establishing in a new environment, right? So the roots start developing. You can see here, this is already still attached to the mother and the roots start developing happily. And so we measured the roots too. And so basically, the roots basically start appearing in June. And so this is again the same plot, but showing the roots. And you can see that, um, so they start developing when the plants are about nine months old, assuming they started, they were appearing in October, about 20, 30% of them have roots. And all the plantlets of whether you have uh, five divisions or five plantlets or five, they all end up having roots, the ones that have. And these roots, um, the, the plantlets just have one, two, three roots. So these are some pictures, two roots here, these are three. And some can be really long, you know, like seven centimeters, but they're usually about two, three, four centimeters, at least in when we measured this, which was, you know, and the longest were in June, July. So they have, you know, they're growing these baby plants or baby super plants compared to the the, the sexual results of the same plant investment. And this is what happens to the adults. So this is uh, through time, the size of the adults, the gray is the ones that have the cerebrous platelets, and the black is the vegetative plants that have not undergone sexual reproduction. So you can see, this is the maximum leaf length, this is the leaf number, leaf width, basically all the patterns show the same, that the Plants that are reproducing, that are doing pseudovipary, the mothers are doing worse, are smaller than the plants that are not reproducing sexually or asexually in this case, right? So there seems to be potentially negative effects uh, because you're investing in, in this. But if there were a negative effects, they're at least for now not observed in terms of plant mortality, 
Um, we haven't seen, but also one problem we have is that with the permanent plots, we've lost a lot of the actual tagging. So our ends are really low. So we don't really know if there's no difference in mortality or just kind of tag it. But what we do know is that we have not seen any mortality for any of the vegetative plants. And we have seen mortality for the ones that we produce. So, and then what happens to these plants? Well, they start dispersing or not. We want to know, no? like, are they going to recruit in the meadow? Are they dispersing like the seeds do? And so we did transect in and out, and I'm going to go past, but um, basically, you know, at, uh, at intervals, we would count if they, if they were attached or loose. And it, when they were in a two meter long, we would count how many there were because Working with these, the people who here work with Posidonia in the summer know how long the leaves are and how hard it is to count stuff. It's, it can be complicated. So, so basically, we did this at the two sides. And so this is uh, the presence of planets that are attached in gray or loose through time. And basically, you see that you know, most of them are attached 80% in the in, in the summer and then in the fall they start decreasing but this is the same trend for both and here's the numbers you know the, this density we have and you clearly see again that there's basically well more and it decreases but that it doesn't seem like the ones that detach remain in the bed they don't seem to 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 stay there and so for for uh, comparing inside and outside, so this is the same figures we just saw for Yetas, no? so the percentage and the numbers. And if you compare with what happens outside the meadow, you clearly see that the, the percentage of, of, of plantlets is much higher and the numbers can sometimes be very high. And this <laughs> seems to be major in the fall, right? So it kind of coincides with in the summer, most of the plants are still attached to the mother and then maybe because of storms or we don't know, they start detaching and appearing in the outside. And so when you look at what these plants look like, because one of the things was like, well, maybe the plants that are outside are dispersing because they are have different development than the ones that are inside or, or something. And there's like some you know, mechanism or one maybe don't have as much roots or not. And, and so far we haven't seen much different. So just these are just the numbers of the no, the the of plants legs that were inside of the different life or oh, life stages. Sorry, divisions. You no, know, the ones that only have one, two, three, four, five, and the percentage here indicate the percentage of plants that have roots, which is between thirty and sixty percent inside and outside. There. So this is the total number. There are many more uh, plants outside than inside. The distribution is similar, so most of the same sizes are are in and out, and they all seem to they about fifty percent of them have roots. So there's not a clear uh, like plant trait that determines when they're dispersed. Then the ones that are inside loose are very low, and there's very large variation in terms of their roots. Some have none, some have a lot, so not a clear. So. Um, so I guess what I, my main things were that, yeah, that 50 percent of them have plant, uh, um, the most have, have, have roots, and most most have between two and, and five and three, four roots, but some can have eight roots, no, but most of them are pretty similar. I'm not showing you later, but yeah. So there doesn't seem to be major differences in what the plants look like inside or outside. So what do we know? Well, we know that indeed. A mass flowering of Posidonia oceanica is triggered by marine heat waves. This is the first time we have seen Pseudomiviparina marine plant. And again, it seems to be uh, in response to a marine heat wave, as well as what we know from Posidonia oceanica and Australis in the past. These planets can become really large um, after six months and can have roots after nine months, meaning that they can start uh, establishing pretty much a year earlier than the seedlings that would have uh, appeared at the same time that the sexual reproduction took place. Plantlets can remain attached for adults for quite a long time, a year, so it would be interesting to see if that's why the adults 
are doing worse because the adults are feeding the, the plants. And then um, most detached plants don't stay in the bed. So it doesn't seem to be a system that is, our, is for colonizing the degraded bed or whatever, but it's more of about dispersing. And of course, many, many questions remain. We're trying to work on them. The main one is, of course, what's driving this? You know, why, why are these plants doing this? Um, it seems like it's related to epigenetics, so Gabriel is going to look into that. Uh, there's not a lot of knowledge from the terrestrial plants either, so so it's all like a, a quite a bit what no, and so and why like what's the advantage of doing this versus seedling? No, that's one of the things we're trying to understand. Like, well, it seems like they're growing much faster, so that would make sense. We're monitoring um, survivorship in the field on the different habitats to see how they develop and survive. Um, and what are the consequences uh, for, for, the, for the population? Does this actually matter for if there's high mortality? And do they, you know, does this dispersal successful? And is this happening in other seagrasses? And we just haven't paid attention. So that's it. Happy to take questions. <laughs> I have like many questions, but I think it's something super exciting. Like in a species like the Posidonia that has been studied for so many years, finding this kind of new mechanism of I mean, I think it's one of, in the Mediterranean Sea, one of the most established species, and suddenly something that has not been observed so, for so many years. So, and it's a very important, it seems like a very important strategy for something at least. So, um, do you think that this kind of, this has been happening? And we didn't see it before. We didn't see it before because, my, because I mean, I, I have like many ideas, with, I, I know it's like super exciting, I think. Finding this kind of mechanism that they happen so rarely that maybe in our observation scale we have not seen it. I wonder in other processes, other species, other ecosystems, if these kind of things are happening that we don't observe them, but they shape or they have shaped that whole ecosystem somehow. So, do you think that this has been something important in shaping the evolution? Not the evolution, but the how. You know, because I, with the Posidonia, they, you always say, no, they grow very slowly. And so they now they cover large extensions because it has been a gradual thing. But maybe it was not that gradual. Yeah, I mean, maybe they are like uh, slow, but then one yeah. of these, you know, high intensity phenomenon, like, for example, no, the idea that, you know, in, in Menorca, pardon, um, for Mediterra Ibiza, there's the largest clone. Yeah. You know, it. You know, maybe the way that that's explained is because this happened at some point, and a lot of these clones recruited in a large expansion, and that's what uh, instead of or in combination with the with the um, the vegetated growth. No, and then something that maybe happened, I don't know how many thousands of years ago, we're still seeing that consequences now. And one important thing is that, you know, in in normal. Well, in seagrasses are in most cases are monospecific beds, right? So it's one species that creates the ecosystem. And so, but but what's more and more obvious is that gen gen genetic diversity within seagrasses is not only important in terms of evolution and adaptation, but actually ecological behavior. Most of this work has been done with ilgrass, but there's also some other evidence. For example, no different genotypes of Zostera marina behave different in terms of nutrient acquisition, susceptibility to being consumed by herbivores, how they recover after a disturbance. And so this combination of asexual and sexual um, phenomenon are critical in determining and shaping these genetic mosaics, which are uh, critical in determining present day um, uh, ecological functioning of the systems, not only the adaptation. I, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think I'm guessing a lot of these uh, answers will be able, now that the genome is, has been 
sequence and all that is probably answers to some of these questions that can be um, you know, answered that way. But um, yeah. Um, my second question, and it's a super silly question, is that because, I mean, this has happened in this extremely warm year. So usually in warm years, the Posidonia, they say, okay, let's make flowers. Let, let's invest a lot in, 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 in reproduction. But in the most, I mean, that last year, like, okay, this is super warm. Now let's invest even more in doing this. But this is not like you, you don't have genetic uh, mixture no, no, no. and you have less dispersal. So it's like, wow, this year is super warm. Let's make a lot of clothes. Yeah, yeah, but but I think, yeah, yeah. So this is one of the things, and and you so know, I I need to learn more about the terrestrial or what is the advantage, yeah. you know. So maybe maybe Posidonia likes warm water. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, so it has not been. Uh, yes. So so this is a discussion I've had many times with Kike Ballesteros, in the sense that it may not be a heat stress response. It may just be a heat response because in terrestrial plants, and I'm glad we have one terrestrial person at least here, many, because the flowering is, in, reproduct, sexual reproduction is energetically costly. So actually a warmer environment may just be a more favorable environment where you have higher metabolism, where you can produce photosynthesize more and produce more and invest in that without the, the negative effect of that investment, right? And so, so yes, so so this is a discussion that I think, I guess one way, easier, simple way would be to look at, you know, heat stress, um, like oxidative stress and protein, and you might have to see if it's actually a stress or not with the implication that, but yes, absolutely, I absolutely, yeah. yeah maybe yeah. all these years that, without flowering is when the, the plant is not as okay, like it's too cold to... to I mean, it, there's no doubt that warming has negative effects on the adult population. Yeah, they die. No? Yeah. Um, but um, yes, whether <laughs> it's one or the other or both, it's... Yeah. Could that be a combinational response, meaning the, the, the part of the... Uh, the asexual reproduction could be like a, a short term response for the high heat, maybe in temperature. So you want to have a, like a crisis response because you have more certainty that your uh, seedlings are going to survive because, as you said, most of the seeds will die. And uh, and a com combined with the long term response because the sexual reproduction would increase diversity and probably the success. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because Absolutely. of the temperature not dropping down in the future. Absolutely. And, and also, we don't really know how successful these plantlets are. I mean, we know that a lot of the seeds, you know, don't make it to the <laughs> right place because they just float wherever. And that the ones that actually make it to the right place, there's high mortality, they grow really slow. But, you know, we don't really know what the success of these plantlets are because we've found them in the in so most of the ones so we've found some that are actually still attached to the mother and are starting to root next to that so they're but the ones that are loose so far they don't seem inside the bed but and the ones that we found was outside they're just most of them were in the sun so that doesn't mean that they are necessarily successful we don't, don't know but but yes they have more capacity to if they if they make a place, they are ready to grow and, and so a priori it makes more sense. And yes, and, and this is a great example that they you know some so and this they also saw in Australia that they produce both the fruit and the and the and the plantlet and the same plant. So that the plant is able to decide somehow. And it makes sense that the combination would be the that would, would make sense. How is this? driven and decided? I don't know. Super interesting. Uh, how is there a trade-off between reproduction, reproducting asexually and sexually within the same plants or needles? So from what I know until now that people studied um, flowering, sexual uh, reproduction, I, uh, there didn't seem to be a long-term effect on the on the plants, so the, they would measure 
you know, the rhizome growth before and after flowering, and there was no, no, the, but, but there has to be some, so we've pad, seen some. Pad, you check if they have more uh, pseudo vivipari, they have lower production? Well, so the ones that, most of the plants that have pseudo vivipari did not have fruit. So, so, so the, the pie charts, the ones that have, Okay, I, I didn't put a slide here because I, I knew I was gonna run out of time. Okay, so these spike charts, not the pink, we don't we know it they're dead flowers. Okay, they they they, they are dead flowers, not dead plantlets. So they had flowers that maybe had dead fruits or they didn't make the fruit. But these guys, so this has 50% pseudo about 25% that bear fruits. This tiny thing blue is this mixed guys that have both. And then this is degraded. Here, 75% are pseudos and these are fruits. So in most cases, there's not been fruit, successful fruiting because this, this didn't have fruits. Am I answering your question? Yeah, I think so. And, uh, and are you checking the success of uh, sexually produced some seedlings? And yes. So we have transplanted seedlings from the same, well, age, the same year, because the ones are, you know, the flower starts, has a plantlet in January. The seedling doesn't start appearing really to July, no? But we've planted them in the same habitat and are monitoring their growth through time to see if, and you so know. so far? So far, they're doing the same, no? More or less? Um, yes. Well, <laughs> <laughs> but for a, what I see, um, each subplanet, because each subplanet um, has like different individuals, they behave like a just one seedling. So I think it's like just one planet of pseudoviparism. It's like one, two, three, depending on the. Yeah. Age. So, so because the size of a seedling is the size, yeah. more or less, of uh, the, the planets that have one, only one plant, but then most of the planets <laughs> have two, three, four. So, but we, we'll have to see if those end up dying or they divide. And, and how easy it would be to genotype the whole needle to see whether they are pseudo vivibers or not? Because yeah. if you find the same genotypes, but yes, so are... we have so we we did a explicitly spatial sampling. So and we sampled. So we're well, we're genotyping the vegetative, the pseudo viviparous, the mixed, and the flowering to see if they're or not the same clone and and then uh if you know if they are not what the epigenetic so you are actually doing that well already. Gabriel is doing it yes <laughs> okay. well he has the samples and that yeah but you don't have any no, results no 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 I mean because this is just a naturalistic observation that we're like oh my god this is crazy we need to study this and we've been doing it as we can, you know, because we're luckily we have to sample many sites for on the project. So we go and you know and and but are you sure this doesn't happen when there is no heat wave? Are you going to check or I mean the let's say that the I mean Jorge and Nuri have been diving in the Balearic Islands much longer than I have as far as I don't know if you guys have seen it before or after these two years. Yes, yes. Yeah. But yeah, I mean the percentages here are some are really high, you know. Mm -hmm. That some of the percentages here were really high. So I have seen it but only in years when there was massive flowering at the same time. Yeah. 
dias antes do pai não lhe dizer que não tem nada para construir sua lei de não ser bom. Não é verdade? In in this the in this the second picture, so is that the same flower? And, and do you know if when they did that, sorry. they did that the fruit and the plant leaf? We no, we have not been able to monitor an individual mix because there were very few, and and. But is this two or is this the same? Like no, no, this is and then... it's the same inflorescence. The pedicle has. You know, yeah, like, and like then one food. made this is probably another, you know, two mini foods that haven't made it, and this is uh, so it's the same individual. Yeah. Um, I don't know if this is crazy, but have you thought of putting some kind of like you know, like GPS for fishing, <laughs> but to the plantlets to see what the fate of them? <laughs> uh, I, that would be cool. Uh, I mean, you see them in the sun, you assume yeah. that they come from the closest. But maybe they are coming from 200 meters. Yeah, I mean, I don't know, but you know, when we are sampling here, we are in the meadow and we swim outside and they're there. No? Yeah. So I I mean, there could be deeper meadows that we haven't explored where that's coming from. But also we see that there's less and less inside the meadow and meadow. So yeah, and also yeah. to check if they grow. We, 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 yeah, we try, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know how you can GPS uh, zebra spiders yeah, without moving like a lot of money like also. Microchip, something like that. Okay, let's talk. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> you can have to go up there, maybe. And also related to what she said, would it be that this is the pollution happening right now? Like, this is a mechanism that has been, that has evolved in the last, Few years. So I don't the, think so. No? Okay. I don't think so because it's you know it's in Arctic plants and in in arid so in plants that are you know from different uh, you know very different environments where and where that's uh, you know, more common. So for example, one example one cool example is I forget the the, um, the species name now, but it's uh, it's uh, in the alpine meadows. And so this plant it's able to detect the level of snow. And so it can basically tell if the spring is gonna be long enough for the for the plant to produce the fruit, the germination. And if, if it sees that it's not, then it switches to do the plant leaf. So it has more time to actually colonize because otherwise the but those leaves in the same environment forever, let's say, no? Yes, so but are... I think that has to be from a, a you know, well, I don't know. No, no, no. I, I, ha I don't I mean, know, but I'm just thinking maybe if we think you. I mean, I, you know, we are on it, like seeing this in a, like this species has been here for millennia, oh, right? Really so, 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 what's the likelihood that this has happened in the past? But maybe, maybe it was more common in the past in in other in other conditions where the ocean evolved. Maybe it was more common, and then, and then the water was warmer. And yeah, and who knows if other environmental conditions also affect, you know, CO2, whatever. The beginning you said that the plant must be different. So was I, I was. No, no. So some seagrass species of another not genus, not Posidonia, Amphibolo is Antalosodendron, those two genus are filiparms. Yes. So they because now I'm wondering if it's doing so well with the plant. Like, why well, don't do the same with the baby with part? With <laughs> sexually reproduced. Uh, I mean, yeah, that would make much more sense because the old of them are lost in yeah. uh, that's yeah, maybe we can genetically modify them. <laughs> so maybe one last question before the video. Mm. Oh. Yeah. Uh, when you talk about uh, marine waves, what do you know what's the difference? Just passing the threshold of temperature, or maybe it's more related with the ratio of change of the temperature? Maybe just to understand what's the trigger. Is the fact that the temperature increased fast, or is passing a, a level of temperature? I think it's that the the temperature reaches a higher temperature for a, a, a long enough period yeah, yeah. Yeah. That, that I mean at least with with Nuria's data no it was like um 
I forget now, but clearly uh, there were certain temperatures where the mortality increased a lot. So, so I don't know how long the marine heat wave has to be. But it doesn't seem like we're going to have to worry about that because there's going to be plenty of more <laughs> Okay, so we can leave it here. In 2003, 2022, uh, this is like summer heat wave, very strong, and we need to extreme uh, absolute temperatures. My question is that is that really the, the, the fact that people the matters? The flowering is in October, so yeah. after the summer. Okay. Or, or do also my heat wave in, in fall or in, in spring or whatever, over time it matters? I, I mean, that's a very good question. When, when and for how long does the trigger need to occur for this to happen? I, I don't have the answer, um, but maybe now there's enough data. If, if people are able to track the first flowering, which I don't know how many people do that because, you know, we have to go very often to the place to see that. But yeah, that's a very good question. Yeah, I don't know. Okay, so now, yes. Thank you very much, Fiona. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.